Okay, so good evening, everyone. Uh, it is the 22nd of December 2021, and welcome to the final uh, webinar, BOMS Educational webinar uh, of this year. Um, we have a fantastic uh, guest who's going to be talking to us about a, a really, really important topic. But just ahead of that, I'd like to thank Ethicon as the sponsor of this evening. Thank you all for making time on a Wednesday evening pre-Christmas to join us and listen in uh, to Mary. And just a couple of announcements about the uh, upcoming events. So we have the next journal club will be on Wednesday, the 12th of January, 2022. Again, 8 p.m. GMT, uh, followed by the next webinar will be the last Wednesday of the month, Wednesday 26th of Jan, and that should be a superb talk about sleeve complications after health tourism, and I've invited a really, really fantastic speaker for that. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to tune in to a real expert in her field. Uh, so we have delighted to introduce Mary O'Kane, who is a lifelong supporter of BOMS, former BOMS Council member. She's an honorary consultant uh, dietitian, as many of you know, in Leeds, uh, very active on Twitter, uh, loves abs absolutely everything and anything to do with obesity and supporting patients. Fellow of the British Dietetic Association, IFSO Integrated Health Chair, um, and also ASO trustee. So she uh, wears many hats um, and is absolutely uh, um, an expert in the field. And I've invited Mary to speak about the BOMS uh, nutritional guidelines, which we, most of us, I think, follow in the UK. Uh, please send in lots and lots and lots of questions uh, as the webinar goes along. Uh, and I'll, I promise to try to answer as many of these, or rather invite Mary to answer as many of these as possible. So please, if you can post your questions via the Q&A button, because it's only me chairing this evening, uh, and I want to try to keep hold of all the questions, okay? So it'll be a 30 minute talk, which is recorded. So we'll be able to share the recording of the session. Uh, um, hopefully within the next couple of days, we'll put that via social media. Um, and um, as always, a 30 minute talk and then 15 minutes for questions. And hopefully we'll finish as always on time, quarter to nine. Okay, Mary, the floor is yours. So firstly, thank you very, very much for supporting BOMS and the educational webinar program and looking forward to hearing you speak about the nutritional guidance. Um, thank you very much for that really kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here for the last meeting of the year as well. So, um, the, um, obviously I'm speaking about a subject very close to my heart. And um, what I want to highlight is uh, that though we've got disclosures, they are nothing to do with this topic. In, um, and what I'm focusing on is our, the British Obesity and Metabolic Surgery Society guidelines, which were published in 2020 last year. And I'll be referring to them, but they are open access as well. And I want to highlight the fantastic working group that we had. So we had six dietitians, two general practitioners, four obesity physicians, of which two were chemical pathologists, two surgeons, a trainee, and very importantly, two patient representatives. One of them is Iris Macmillan, and sadly she died just as the um, guidelines were being published, so they have been dedicated to her. So when we started um, the guidelines, they were an update to the 2014 guidelines, and so we started the search there. And um, I used um, the benefit of uh, librarians in, uh, at LTHT, uh, especially Daniel Park, and he did a fantastic literature search so much quicker and so much faster than I could have done, and much more comprehensive. And what we're interested in was both ad adults and adolescents and also pregnancy. And of course, wanted to know what we should be monitoring pre-surgery, what we need to monitor after surgery, which vitamins and minerals we should be recommending, and also how to treat those nutritional deficiencies. We did exclude conditions such as celiac disease because that would impact on nutrition. We are taking account of those um, procedures that were very common in the UK at that time. So that was the gastric band, the sleep gastrectomy, the rheumatoid gastric bypass, and also the pancreatic diversion or duodenal switch. We did originally include one anastomosis gastric bypass and also uh, the single anastomosis duodenal ill switch in literature search, but there's hardly any literature about nutritional outcomes back in January 2018. 
uh, we ended up with over 600 papers and the guidelines group, uh, we went through the abstracts, screened them, and then Helen Peretti and I went through the full papers um, and uh, that they were what went through to, the, to uh, our guidelines. Now the next bit was the really hard bit, and that's because we're having to go methodically through each paper. We had massive data extraction forms, very grateful to the person who devised that. And because we're looking at all the macronutrients before surgery, after surgery, and then all the different um, procedures, but remembering that a real myogastric bypass by one surgeon might be different to that by another surgeon, one astomosis gastric bypass might differ, the duodenal switch might have a different length channel. So it was actually quite hard to do. And also people get followed up for different lengths of time. And I'd get sometimes quite excited when somebody's followed up for five years to find out there was hardly any patients left by that time. So we had to use quality assessment tools to what for each study type, and that was really important, but very tedious. The evidence is unrated, and so you've got the meta-analysis, which is very high-grade systematic reviews and RCTs with low risk of bias, down to what we'd call um, expert opinion or even clinical guidelines. And unless we looked at the information and the studies that were included in the guidelines, we class these as level four. Extracting the data was difficult. And then we had to um, analyze it and then come up with our draft recommendations and grade them. And I've put this as an iterative process, but I have to say that there was using never any doubt uh, among the committee about what our recommendations would be in a sense. It was more the iterative process was actually more about getting the wording right, but we did have agreement about the recommendations. And also pointing out that the grade recommendation is more about the strength of the evidence, but it might be low grade evidence, but still clinically important recommendation. So when we start to look at pre-op screening, um, as you'd expect, we uh, are recommending that vitamin B12, folate and iron, and also vitamin D are screened preoperatively. And these are very common deficiencies in people with obesity. However, um, the calcium um, is quite low grade evidence. And this is partly because when you actually read the studies, very few of them actually measure calcium before surgery. The reason for doing PTH was actually to rule out primary hypothyroidism. And then because of the growing interest in malabsorption procedures, and certainly in the UK we have been doing the judial switches, we thought it would be good practice to recommend that for patients going forward from uh, malabsorption procedures to consider uh, measuring fat soluble vitamins and also trace minerals. And then as you'd expect, is actually treat those deficiencies before surgery. And I think this is sort of common practice from our original guidelines back in 2014, apart from the, the recommendations about malabsorption procedures. But at that time, people were sometimes quite resistant to actually screening people before surgery. So when we start to look at uh, post-operative monitoring, um, again, uh, as you'd expect, measuring hematemics and, and also vitamin D. And again, very good grade evidence for, for doing this. Uh, the reason why I've put an asterisk uh, against vitamin B12 is because um, it would be unusual or not necessary to keep on monitoring vitamin B12 after the gastric band. Again, the, uh, for calcium, it's low grade evidence because in the studies that we're reading, very few actually report on calcium. And for the most part, when we're actually looking at the frequency of monitoring, but that was actually a good practice point and what we felt uh, was reasonable. Because quite often, probably most of the changes are going to be in that first year. And with people being on vitamins and minerals, it's a good opportunity to, to monitor what the response to those vitamin and mineral supplements are. And then once the patient is stable, go on to annual review. We don't routinely monitor thiamine in the UK. And it's because if there's any risk of deficiency, we suggest treating it. But I'm aware that's different in other countries. So one of the headaches we had was about how much vitamin D should we be aiming for. And back in 2014, we suggested um, the vitamin D levels of 50 nanomoles per litre. And it's a question, did we stay with that? or should we be uh, doing what other guidelines do and recommending 75 nanomoles per litre? 
And it was actually very hard to actually establish the evidence base behind what's the desirable uh, vitamin D level. And certainly there's a couple of excellent systematic reviews by Chagtora. Uh, one was in RC, uh, of a systematic review of RCTs. The other one was ob observ observational studies. And what she concluded that though guidelines recommend 75 nanomoles per litre, it's actually not based on robust evidence. So in our group, did we stick with 50 that we had in 2014, or did we go with what everybody else was doing, recommending 75? And this is where our chemical pathologists came in very handy, uh, because they talked about the variability in assays anyway. So in the end, we decided to aim for 75, but you can see it's actually based on low-grade evidence. And if you look at some uh, guidelines such as the SMBS Integrated Health Guidelines, again, they've made similar recommendations, but the point is made, it's actually based on low-grade evidence. So plenty of room for research. Then we look at malabsorption procedures. I personally was very disappointed about the amount of literature around, uh, of the lack of literature around uh, the one anastomosis gastric bypass and the SADIS and nutritional outcomes. There's much more uh, information around about the duodenal switch, but the one anastomosis gastric bypass and SADIS are not new procedures. So I'd expect to see more. Certainly after we'd completed a literature search, but we weren't able to include it, there was a systematic review of the SADIS, which looked at 12 papers and only four of them reported nutritional outcomes. So we took the decision um, that, um, because it's recognising, certainly based on the duodenal switch and the information that we did have, that those who have malabsorptive procedures are at greater risk of nutritional deficiencies. And as you'll be aware that Kamal Mahawa is on our group and he does the anastomosis gastric bypass, and we agreed to take the view that if it was um, with a, a, if it had a bilopancreatic limb of 150 or less, we'd treat it like a real gastric bypass. If it was greater than 150 or if it's a sadist, we treat it like a duodenal switch. So when we start to then look at the post-operative monitoring of the malabsorption procedures, vitamin A deficiency is very common and there is good grade evidence to recommend uh, checking vitamin A regularly. Uh, what we don't know is how frequent, but again, we made the decision for vitamin A to go for every three months and then once levels are stable, switch to annual review. But also remembering that if patients have steatorrhea, they're going to be at greater risk of vitamin A deficiency. And also um, remembering to ask in clinic questions such as, have they got itchy eyes? Do they have problems with night vision? And certainly if a patient has protein malnutrition, we should be looking more widely at nutrition screening. When we then look at vitamin E and K, um, again, certain after you do switch, vitamin E and K deficiencies are common, and we found that with our own patients in Leeds. It used to be classed as okay to class clotting factors as an indication of vitamin K deficiency, but there was an excellent paper came out before we went to publication looking at vitamin K and monitoring. And uh, what the author was pointing out was that you do need to measure vitamin K and uh, the protein juice vitamin K absence for antagonism. I'm not quite sure if it's that's PIPCA2 or how that's done, but measuring that, and that's the best way to actually uh, monitor vitamin K. So we, again, made the recommendation about annual monitoring for these and also checking vitamin E if there's unexplained anemia on neuropathy. Now, um, what is difficult is that in Leeds, we can check these, but many barrier surgeries the centres can't, and certainly GPs can't. So this is big implications for the monitoring of malabsorption procedures. Then we start to look at post-operative vitamin and mineral supplementation. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but I'm just going to bring out some points um, through these. So one of the questions we've had is about how did we come up with the recommendation about iron? And certainly from the studies that, were, that came through for our literature search, it was shown that sometimes when patients are on iron, they will still end up with the iron deficiency anemia. Now, there could be issues about adherence and other factors as well. And certainly uh, many of them made the point that um, in menstruating women, requirements are higher. But what I'd really say, you can't just put the patient on iron and just leave them because you've really got to check what those blood results are. 
And I have come across one patient whose iron levels, protein levels were continuing to increase despite us stopping the ferrous sulfate. And she actually had hematomicrosis. So it's really important to look at those blood results. We also made recommendations about vitamin D supplementation. And sometimes in other guidelines, it can be quite prescriptive about exactly how much to actually prescribe. But again, I'd make a plea, don't just put the patient on vitamin D, you have got to monitor it. We had a patient recently, he was on 800 international units of vitamin D and most guidelines make much higher recommendations. The GP noticed that vitamin D levels had climbed to 118 and then three months later, he checked them again and they're at 157. So quite rightly, he stopped the vitamin D. Um, so some patients might not need very much, but others will need more. And certainly for patients with the duodenal switch, I see that they definitely need more. And in some cases, we've had to refer them onto our bone clinic for much higher doses. Some people have looked at the guidelines and interpreted them as being that we're saying that we don't need to worry about dietary calcium, and that's not true. And I've lifted this as a recommendation. What we're saying is that we don't know exactly how much calcium people need after barotary surgery. We think requirements are higher, but we don't know how much. And certainly as well, with the duodenal switch and malabsorption procedures, there's going to be more calcium malabsorption. So um, when I've looked back at the other guidelines, it's very hard to see where they've got their recommendations from. So what we did was emphasize that, um, make sure the patient has a good dietary calcium intake, Dietitians should be able to assess calcium intake and there's also lots of uh, calcium monitors as well. So quite easy to, to do a counter. And then if you think calcium intake is not that great is then put them on a calcium and vitamin D combined supplement. Um, so it is okay to use supplements, but also wanted to make the point that sometimes I've seen that in practice, if the PTH is raised and, and vitamin D is normal, I've seen practitioners put the patient on extra vitamin D thinking that more is better. Whereas in fact, it's probably an indication the patient needs more calcium. So again, it's really important to actually make changes, but actually monitor what you're doing. Um, another area that can also cause a lot of debate is the method in which we supplement vitamin B12. And it was a perfect opportunity to obviously go through the literature. And what we found is that there is some limited evidence for high dose oral. It might just be in a certain surgery. It might only be for a short time of follow-up and there is limited evidence. When we looked for the evidence for intranasal or under the tongue, I couldn't find any studies where it's been done in patients who have barotary surgery. We know that people have good responses to intramuscular. And also some of the studies actually made the point that although they might be recommending high doses of oral supplements, it can be more difficult to actually determine the adherence. Remembering that we've also got obesity physicians, GPs on the group, pathologists, and there's real concern about patients possibly having undiagnosed and untreated vitamin B12 deficiency because it does a lot of damage, irreversible neuropathy, uh, or some acute combined degeneration of the spinal cord. So our consensus was that we'd still continue with intramuscular vitamin B12 injections. Might change in the future when we've got better evidence, but that is how we that's our strong recommendation for the moment. And then for supplementation after malabsorption procedures, again, because of the degree of um, vit uh, vitamin A, vitamin E and K deficiencies after, after the duodenal switch, and some of the papers I've seen more recently uh, of other procedures, we recommended that additional supplementation is needed in, on top of the normal vitamin and mineral supplement. And again, we've made starting recommendations, but it's really hard to know exactly how much the patient should have, because certainly we've, we've made uh, these, uh, done uh, this in Leeds, and then patients have needed to actually increase the supplements. And even on high doses, we've had patients with fat soluble vitamin deficiency requiring intramuscular injections. So again, it's a starting point, but monitoring is really important. 
But I mean, another issue, and any of us working in laboratory surgery fields know the risks of thyroid deficiency and how quickly it can come on and actually the severe consequences. And this caused a bit of debate because the SNBS IH guidelines came out and they were recommending 12 milligrams of thiamine a day. When we went back to look at literature, um, I could see that it was only seemed based on two studies. There may be more robust evidence, but at the time we weren't able to actually find it. So we couldn't make a similar sort of recommendation about the amount. Um, however, what we know is that if people lose weight rapidly, they've got poor nutritional intake, got reduction in their appetite, um, all the things that people get after barotic surgery, but also if they've got problems such as vomiting, and it could be because of stretching over tight band, that, that they are actually risk factors for development of thiamine deficiency. Sometimes patients will come in with dehydration and end up on IV glucose, which again must exacerbate the problem. And deficiencies can present within nine to 18 days. And I've seen it where um, in one case, it was a patient who had surgery elsewhere, was struggling, was admitted to a local district hospital and eventually got transferred to us. She came on crutches, an unstable gait, and the classic symptoms of, of thiamine deficiency, but it was actually too late. Um, we also had another patient who um, disappeared after thought we couldn't manage to get hold of her, and it's before the days when people have mobile phones. And eventually she made contact several months later, She'd felt unwell after surgery, didn't come back to see us, went to stay with an elderly aunt outside of Leeds, and then presented with confusion and amnesia and the classic symptoms of thyroid deficiency. So we do class it as a, um, a medical emergency. So as a result, we've said that definitely got, obviously got to make, um, meet the RDAs. We don't know how much additional thiamine people need. Uh, we suggested using all thiamine or vitamin co as strong the first three to four months post-surgery. But certainly, if there's any suspicion at all of thiamine deficiency, it's actually treat because you'll do no harm and may actually save a lot of um, difficulties afterwards. And also made the rocket recommendations that it's really important that clinicians should be educated about factors which cause thiamine deficiency. And that isn't just us, it's actually about general practitioners. How many of us put that in our discharge letters? Do our accident and emergency departments know that they admit somebody with, thiamine, that with uh, vomiting, that they could be at risk of thiamine deficiency? If one of our patients ends up on an outlying ward, do the staff there know the risks? And then also making sure that patients know um, that if they have problems such as vomiting, even if they think it's gastroenteritis, they need to make contact with us. And we can always get them started on treatment and then obviously have more investigations to find the cause. So um, another issue was the zinc, copper and selenium supplementation. And when we actually look at the papers, there are a couple of systematic reviews for zinc and copper. However, most of the uh, papers are actually single case reports or two or three cases reported. It's reported after sleeve and normal gastric bypass and certainly um, is reported after the gesion switch. And what the feeling is, is that the longer the person is, the greater the time from surgery, the more the person may be at risk. Um, it may be dependent on the limb length. So for instance, the osmosis gastric bypass or the BP limb uh, length increase in absorption. Certainly if the patient with the genital switch has a small common channel, that's going to increase risk. And similarly for selenium as well. I certainly see it after, um, we've seen it after the rheumatoid gastric bypass and after the uh, duodenal switch. Now I have put down here the symptoms of zinc deficiency, copper and, and selenium deficiency, but I would have to say that, that we've picked them up by actually routinely monitoring rather than actually by symptoms. And I think possibly by the time the patient is presenting with symptoms, they probably are very deficient. So I'd rather that people are monitored and actually then address us as we go along. I think one of the issues though um, is zinc induced copper deficiency. And certainly there are many case reports of that in the literature. And I know of at least two cases in the UK, not our patients, but I do know of at least two, and I'm sure there are more. So I actually think um, all these deficiencies tend to be underreported. But also I think with the zinc induced copper deficiency, it could be because 
someone's been started on zinc because of an issue and then people forget to actually stop the zinc. It could be the patient taking an over-the-counter preparation because everyone believes that zinc is going to cure everything else as well. And yet there's no warnings in BNF about the risks of zinc-induced copper deficiency. Again, it's hard to say how much we should recommend. Um, it's probably not a surprise that 15 milligrams is the amount that's actually in the normal vitamin and mineral prescription, uh, vitamin and mineral that's available on prescription in the UK. We know that for juvenile switch, people will need more. And so we recommend doubling up on that prescription. Um, and also, again, it's very hard to find any data recommending uh, with a recommendation of how much selenium. So making sure that that vitamin and mineral supplement does contain selenium. I got quite excited that we we're including adolescents and I thought we're going to have some fantastic recommendations. But in fact, there was only eight studies or reviews covering adolescents and one covering adolescents and adults. What they all make is that nutritional deficiencies are very common preoperatively. And they, um, also when we're treating those deficiencies, it's what we do for adults is not the same as what we do for adolescents. Vitamin A definitely needs specialist support and vitamin D replacement is different. And obviously we've got to take account of the growth and sexual development of adolescents. Pregnancy, um, there was a very good review by, um, guidelines by Shaw um, that came out um, just before ours. Um, and so very, very similar recommendations. So about women reaching weight stability and a better diet before getting pregnant. And then the UK, for BMI less than 30, we recommend 400 micrograms. And for BMI greater than 30 or a type 2 diabetes, five milligrams. And I know that NICE are going to look into that. So that might change in the future as well. Um, also, the recommendation about monitoring and micronutrients more frequently. But as you know, women will present in our bariatric surgery clinics after discharge. So maybe four or five months before we even know that they're pregnant. And then also I've put a link down to the site about um, reference ranges in pregnancy because zinc tends to go down, copper goes up, vitamin A falls. So sometimes you can think there's an abnormal result and it's actually the fact that the person is pregnant. Now I'm going to touch on, uh, just uh, quickly touch on the other set of guidelines. So um, there's the the NICE quality standards uh, was published and it came out two quality statements and we have put these both in our guidelines and they're also both in the NICE clinical guidelines 189. And it's about bariatric um, aftercare remaining with the centre for two years and then the patients uh, should be discharged back to shared care. And at that time when the guidelines were published, there were strong recommendations for the commissioners now, at that time, we were also working on some long-term follow-up guidelines and uh, on behalf of NHS England, because at that time, bariatric surgery was under the care of specialist commissioners. But as our paper was published and the nice quality standards were published, commissioning went back to local commissioning. So unfortunately, we weren't able to impose this shared care onto local areas. So the, guide, the paper that I mentioned is here. Again, we had a comprehensive working group it's published in 2016 and we made lots of different recommendations about all aspects of aftercare, including reactive hypoglycemia, for instance. Um, Helen Peretti, GP, developed four shared care models and we also did a long list of when to refer back and um, which can actually go to the GP. It's not open access, but if anybody wants to contact me, I can actually obviously share the paper. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go into great detail about the shared care models, but Helen came up with four different models, and there's probably a lot more, but all of them had um, an annual review by a specialist dietitian, and I think if there's an annual review by a specialist dietitian looking at nutrition, we could pick up problems as they occur. Um, but also sometimes it might be the GP taking the lead, it might be the specialist centre taking the lead, or it might be combined, but we felt there's no excuse for uh, shared care models not to be commissioned. It happens with diabetes, respiratory problems as well. So just to conclude, so the benefits, we've got more robust evidence base. Um, it's applicable for patients, uh, for, for the UC NHS. The uh, other guidelines have been absolutely brilliant, but when we try to apply them to the NHS and the UK, 
we do things quite differently to, to other areas. So it was actually for us. Uh, obviously making sure that people optimise before going forward with surgery and just remembering these are starting points for supplementation and monitoring is equally important. I've not touched on the correction of nutritional deficiencies, but they are well covered in the guidelines. Now the challenges is the evidence base. So lack of RCTs, and this is because most papers, everyone's writing up their own results, which is great that they're doing it because that's all contributed to our evidence base. But because of that, we have short follow-up. As I said, you might get excited about a five-year follow-up and find out there's not many patients left in that follow-up. Obviously, there's going to be lost to follow-up. And then because we're reporting our own results, there's going to be some bias. Also, uh, for me, especially with newer procedures, is actually sometimes lots of nutritional parameters were not reported. So I find it quite disappointing, especially if it's an absorbed procedure, that the the, the sometimes no reports about salt sort of vitamins or trace minerals and we do need that that that, that information um, we can't apply it routinely to other groups because we've excluded some groups uh, with the malabsorption procedures as i said many centers can't measure uh, fat soluble vitamins and then also access to high doses of fat soluble vitamins is an issue we managed to get something through our drugs and therapeutics in leeds but that was actually quite difficult and I know other areas are struggling with that. And if we're going to do more of more absorption procedures, we've got to make sure people have access to the right treatment and the right monitoring. Also, there's access, the variable access to monitoring. And I came across a case very recently where vitamin uh, GP had requested vitamin D, but the laboratory, not a leads one, um, had actually declined it, saying the patient wasn't at high risk. Um, also, variable access. BOMS recommend uh, vitamin and minerals be available on prescription because it's treatment, but we know that it's not commissioned in, other, in all areas. And then also, it can be difficult for patients trying to hear long term to this. And also lack of access to lifelong monitoring as well. So just to show our wonderful working group, who are absolutely fantastic, it was really great being part of it, much harder work than any of us anticipated and certainly what I didn't anticipate as much but absolutely fantastic and just making a plug we had lots of females in that group as well so that for me was really good working in a male-dominated profession normally um, and just saying thank you and any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Mary. And as expected, uh, a really comprehensive and fantastic talk in the short amount of time that you had to give. So thank you very much for all your effort also to you and um, your colleagues in the committee who devise these uh, guidelines that we use on a daily basis and we often refer to. Uh, so quite a few questions have come through, some really interesting ones also. I, I just want to ask you, uh, in terms of calcium supplementation post sleeve, why? Why is it included in there as recommended when anatomically there's no alteration in calcium absorption when you do a sleeve? Well, what we say first is actually make sure that the patient has got a good calcium intake. So if they're meeting at least the RDA, they probably are going to be okay, but we can't really assume that as well. So it might be they do need extra on top. But I think sometimes, especially now that, um, I mean, patients will enjoy milk and they enjoy cheese and stuff, but because maybe they move towards more plant-based diets, and that the calcium intake may not be quite as good. So I think it's just don't assume, um, and it's probably better to be slightly on the safe side and give a little bit too much than actually under taking okay. as well. Yeah. Okay, I'll go to the some of the questions that have come via the Q&A. So I think this is a question from a patient. Um, so this patient has prescribed forcible and calcium. She'd like your opinion on the over-the-counter supplements that are available. Are they any good for patients who've had bariatric surgery or a waste of time? The difficulty is, um, um, is that when we have things like forcible, it's got to be made to a certain standard. The uh, which did a report I don't know, it's a year ago or so, um, I think it's been a couple, and actually showing that some of the over-counter preparations, because they don't need to be made to the same standard, are not as robust, so we can't always guarantee what the composition is. Mm. And then also, what we're trying to do is actually look for things like a minimum of two milligrams of copper. So it might mean that the patient's got to double up on it, or sometimes make a lot more. So I think is that if, if people are wanting to use an over-counter one, it's actually let the dietitian know so she can actually look it up on screen or, or whatever 
um, or even take a photo of the composition, actually send it, and then can have a, a good dialogue about about some of the other counter ones as well. So that's incredible that something sold over the counter is completely unregulated and there's no guarantee on quality. Yeah, that's what which we're saying. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The problem with forcible about one in one in three, one in four patients, they don't tolerate it because of yeah. nausea. Uh, and I hear that a lot when I follow up patients. What would you recommend as the alternative to forcible, which causes so much nausea? Yeah, um, I know that Holland and Barrett do um, a vitamin and mineral supplement, which is pretty good. It's got two milligrams of copper. Um, also, there's products such as Sinatogenator Z. And actually, some of the supermarket ones, um, mm. Uh, which are A to Z are actually not bad composition. And what we'd normally do is actually to say take two of those a day. Yeah. Um, but I, I think I find as well that sometimes a supplement in England, if um, we've got a patient in the Republic of Ireland, the composition's different. So yeah. you have to actually really look um, and see. The small print on the back of the pack. Yeah. Okay, so good, yeah. the close liaison with the dietitian, which is, uh, I think, hopefully most of us advise anyway. Uh, a question from a surgeon. Um, so if you have a female patient menstrual age with iron deficiency anemia following Roux-en-Y bypass, not responding to oral iron, no evidence of GI bleeding, so there's no occult blood loss. Uh, what's your view on prophylactic iron infusions? Yeah, the, what we've done is, is in these, it certainly would follow the NICE guidelines for treating iron deficiency anemia, and then we would um, refer on to haematology for further advice. So we would tend to actually ask an, another profession to actually look at the patient as well. But I know that some of our patients have had needed iron infusions hmm. as well. So, yeah. Okay. The, there's, a, there's a couple of questions on vitamin D. I was going to make a comment that some teeth tier threes, uh, our service included, we don't routinely measure vitamin D and we don't screen for it, for it pre-op uh, because it's actually quite expensive to do. And if, you know, the vast majority of patients are going to be vitamin D deficient anyway, isn't there an argument just to put everybody on vitamin D supplements pre-op? What do you think of that? The, uh, well, there's individual variation to vitamin D and the case that I've just quoted was where a patient's was vitamin D levels were continuing to rise on only 800 international units. So unless we monitor, we don't know what the right amount is. <clears throat> so um, obviously we were very, very keen not to get vitamin D uh, toxicity either. Okay. Um, but I don't see how we can actually know unless we actually monitor it. So yes, monitoring, especially post-op, yeah. I guess. Uh, but it was oh. more it was more the pre-op screening. Um, there was a question also from uh, one of the patients about pre-op screening. Um, do you think that should be done in everybody? The um, uh, my background is is obviously the NHS, and I worked in the medical tier three service. So it's actually just part, that was our common practice with all patients. We would do nutritional screening um, when we first met them. They may not all be going for surgery, but we know vitamin D deficiency, iron deficiency anemia, um, vitamin B12 is a bit more common than we'd like, um, folate deficiency. They're fairly common in people with obesity, probably fairly common in most of the UK anyway, but certainly with people with obesity. So we would routinely screen them in the NHS um, weight management service um, and then obviously make sure they're optimised if they're going forward for bariatric surgery but we treat it anyway. Okay when I follow up my patients post-op uh, I often hear that the GPS check their bloods the B12 level is normal and the GP is refusing to give them uh, an IM injection because the B12 level is normal so what would you say to our colleague GPs about that? Yeah it, I mean prevention is really important a lot of patients also um, I remember with Erla Narsham, who uh, was on our previous guidelines group, because he's uh, Norwegian, uh, and he's the same in Norway, a lot of patients will actually say that they, coming up to the time of the B12 injection, they feel more lethargic, and they feel a bit of a boost of B12, but not quite sure why. Yeah. But also, um, the um, Dr. Manisha Sharma, who was on our guidelines group as well, is very much into B12, and she was saying that um, if, the vitamin B12 is below about 500, the patient could be subclinically deficient because mm -hmm. there's other investigations it can do, but we haven't, you know, it would again be more expensive. So um, always aiming to keep the vitamin B12 actually high. So it might be that um, might not need to be done quite as frequently, but um, it wouldn't. 
I'd rather see a much higher, I'd rather see very high between no, no, of than course. actually on the lower level. Yeah. Yeah. It's more, I guess, the education of uh, uh, colleagues in primary care that actually it's not the absolute level you can have functional deficiency and it's how to do that and get around the difficulties of uh, that communication without having to send letter after letter after letter. That's right, yeah. And I think, like say, yeah, the education side is important. And I think often when the general practitioner does understand why we're recommending something, they will use it go around, uh, along with it. Okay. A question here from Sandra about, um, it would be really, just a comment, I guess, it would be really helpful to include some information about some of the nutrient and drug interactions following some of the malabsorptive procedures. Is that on your to-do list? <laughs> no, not at the moment. I mean, the... Can you signpost, I, can you signpost people to any helpful resources? Um, I, I don't. Uh, the... Probably Dr. Manisha Sharma would be able to address some of it as well because she's a chemical pathologist and she does. So remember, she's really so remember this question because I have invited her to give us a talk in June uh, and we're just waiting to hear back from her. But yeah, yeah. But, you remember but, that but, and you post it on the chat for her. Yeah, I will do. But Manisha is absolutely brilliant, but she will definitely know a lot more about the drug interactions than me. Yeah. Oh. A uh, question from Amanda about patients who have um, surgery abroad uh, or no follow up at the, they're not offered follow up mm -hmm. or an aftercare package, I guess, if uh, they have it privately. So can you comment on how supplementation and monitoring should be monitored in those patients? Where does the responsibility lie, etc.? Yeah, I mean, it's a really, really difficult one. And um, the, I know that certainly in Leeds, we're not commissioned to um, see people who've had surgery abroad. Um, the care remains the general practitioner. What would tend to happen in practice is that when I was working in the NHS is get a call from the GP saying we've got this patient and I certainly would uh, be sending the recommendations about what to monitor and what to give and in some cases where there's been concern because obviously we don't want people to be ill we have occasionally done like one-off um, consultations with the patient to make sure that everything is okay um, but it is a difficult one. It's really contentious as well. Okay. Question from Kath here, um, who I think is a dietitian. Uh, is it common for GPs to refuse to prescribe vitamin and mineral supplements? Is it a local formulary thing uh, or what? I think it's a local commissioning thing. So I know that's parts of the country where I think the commissioners decide that uh, they won't um, allow their general practitioners to prescribe. So I don't think it's necessarily an individual GP. Um, I think it's really important to actually talk to commissioners and certainly in Leeds, that's what we did. And they felt very strongly that actually prevention of deficiencies is much better than trying to manage them. And I think there's a paper by Smelt recently about adherence to vitamin and mineral supplements. And I think they looked at the cost of actually routine prescribe you know routine supplements as opposed to actually correction of deficiencies so I think it's really important to actually talk to commissioners mm. um, and make that point that it's actually better to have treatment you know for instance it's really accepted isn't it that if a patient has this um, total gastrectomy a partial gastrectomy intramuscular v12 nobody would question that why do they do it after barrage surgery? Yeah, so. Very yeah. true. Yeah, absolutely. Very true. A uh, couple of interesting comments on the chat um, from Gillian in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, so she's mentioned that the, in Northern Ireland, the labs won't check vitamin D unless requested by a consultant, uh, which is uh, crazy, really. Uh, question here about when to start the IEM vitamin B12 injections after sleeve or bypass. Should we wait until three months or should they have it straight away after surgery? Yeah. We, I mean, in theory, um, patients could have up to two years vitamin B12 levels, uh, vitamin B12 in, in uh, anyway, but uh, we tend to routinely do it about three months after surgery. Um, occasionally, when I've run the patient, they've already had it a few weeks after surgery because the general practitioner has been really keen to get it started. Yeah. Um, it's not going to do any harm, but we say three months and maybe three months. What sometimes got to advise is make sure don't start treating as they're already deficient because sometimes the patient ends up going for loading doses when they actually yeah, just... Yes, yeah. I've seen that also, actually, yeah. which is strange because even when you put in your letter exactly the dose and what needs to happen, they uh, get loading doses. Of a few of them. That's right. Yeah. Uh, final question from me, because we are out of time. What, what's your view on the all-in-one bariatric surgery specific supplements that are available commercially? 
There's a few brands out there, I don't want to mention them, but what's yeah, your view? Yeah. I mean, there's lots of different brands and um, I, and I, I think it's great that there's been work done in this area and the research has been done. I think for the, in the NHS in the UK, is just aware that many of our patients are actually from low income groups, areas of deprivation, and actually trying to buy the vitamin and mineral supplements can be a real barrier. Because yeah. um, you mentioned that sometimes some um, areas can't get their prescription, can't get supplements on prescription. And I know I've been contacted by patient support groups saying that, you know, an elderly lady now has just been told she's got to pay so much a month or so much a year to get her supplements um, and, and can't really afford it. And how do we work around this? So I think they have got a place and it's really good, but I know in UK we tend to go for things on prescription. But yeah, it's certainly worth the, the patients to look into that as well. Do you think the NHS should prescribe these as a way to improve uh, patient adherence with um, uh, taking and sticking with taking their supplements? So they're taking one tablet a day as opposed to five or six different tablets a day? Um, or, too that, or too expensive? I, I don't know. Uh, the difficulty is, is, is then uh, is trying to get them on to... Um, the, the, the list of things available on prescription because there has been resistance. The, the vitamin and mineral uh, supplement that we recommend for duodenal switch, for instance, is only licensed for cystic fibrosis. It's not licensed for the use in bariatric surgery. And I did receive an indirect complaint that we were using it inappropriately. But um, why wouldn't we put, get it on prescription if it, it helps those patients? It's again stigma, isn't it? It's all yeah. the stuff that we talk about. Okay, maybe yeah. we're out of time, but we could literally just go all night uh, quizzing you and learning from you. So thank you very, very much uh, for a really uh, educational talk this evening uh, and for supporting the webinar tonight. Um, thank you to Ethicon. Thank you to all uh, of you for joining this evening. And uh, next um, BOMS event then, Journal Club 12th of January, and then the webinar on the 26th of January. Uh, wish you all a lovely Christmas uh, and a happy new year and a safe new year. Mary, thank you very, very much again. Yeah, thank you. Good night all. Bye.